Good morning, Bethel. Let's stand to our feet. We're going to worship the King of Kings this morning. He is worthy to be praised. We're clearing off the surface. You're coming into focus. We're going back to the basics. The glory of your face is the reason why we do this. The winds of worship blowing. The doors of heaven open. Jesus, you're at the center. Lord, help us to remember the reason why we do this. It's all.
morning, Bethel Full Gospel. It's good to be here with you in person. Welcome to those who are tuning in online. We just sang a song that those names of the, of the Lord come right from scripture. He is Jehovah Nisi. He is the banner that's raised when you're going in, when you're going into war. When, when people need to know whose side you're, you're on, Jehovah Nisi, that's who you're, whose banner you're waving. Jehovah Rapha, he is your healer. Jehovah Shalom, he is your peace. And what was that other one? Jaira. Oh, that's, some, uh, that's the one I know the best. <laughs> My provider. Jehovah Jaira. He is a provider. So this morning, lean into that. Remember who he is, who the word of God says he is. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Jesus, we come, we come to you this morning. We know who you are, Father, and we're singing praise to our King, our King of glory. Thank you, Jesus, for meeting us here in this place. In your name. Amen. When I was lost and all alone, your presence was where I found home. You were there. And you're here right now In every high and every low You never left me without hope You were good and you're good right now I've witnessed your faithfulness
witnessed your faithfulness I've seen you breathe life within so I'll pour out my praise again cause you're worthy God you're worthy of all of it your promises never fail I've got stories I'll live to tell so I'll pour out my praise again you're worthy God you're worthy of all of it you're worthy Lord thank you thank you Father who else would rocks cry out to stars to shine perhaps creation longs to have the words to sing but that joy is mine with a thousand hallelujahs we magnify your name you alone deserve forever yours a thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more who else would die for our redemption whose resurrection means our rise there isn't time enough to sing of all you've done but I'll have eternity to try
you alone deserve the glory, the honor and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Come on, every voice in this place. With a thousand hallelujahs. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire time after time. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood, and what he in God, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. I trust in God, my Savior.
sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. to seek you. Lord, I pray that it would be impressed on every heart in this room to seek you first. Because when we seek you, the desires of our hearts change. They're transformed into something more powerful. They're transformed into something more holy than we would have come up with ourselves. Jesus, when we trust in you, when we lean into you, our desires become yours. It says it right in your word. Father, that you would, that you would continue to help us go deeper 
and deeper to know you better. We love you and we worship you. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Welcome to Bethel. We're excited that you decided to join us today. When you came in, you should have received a bulletin, and on the bottom of that bulletin is a connection card. We ask that you go ahead and fill that out with as little or as much information as you feel comfortable sharing with us. Additionally, on the back of our chairs, you will see there are QR codes that you can use your phone to scan and fill out a digital connection card. Also, if you are a first-time guest, please make sure you go out to the foyer and grab a free gift from our welcome desk. Hey church, Pastor Steve here, and I wanna take this opportunity to invite you out to our starting point classes. Our starting point classes are really geared for those who are newer to the church or those who are looking to get more involved and even for those who are looking into official church membership. There's four different classes and we run these classes on the last Sunday night of every month. So whether you're looking to find out more about what we believe or you're looking for a place to serve, Starting Point is the place for you. So come on out and join us last Sunday of the month for our Starting Point classes. Hey Bethel, Easter is coming up really quick and we are super excited here at Bethel at all the things that God has been doing with salvations, baptisms. We are so excited. So we are looking forward to what God is going to do this year for Easter weekend. And we'll be starting off on March 29th with our two Good Friday services at 4.30 and 6. And then March 31st, Easter Sunday, we'll have our 8.30 and 10.30 services. So get out there with that invite card. You can get those at the welcome desk and invite your friends to come on out. And get here early to get a seat. Saturday, March 30th, is our annual Easter egg hunt. Last year, we had 300 children attend the hunt, and this year, we're expecting another great turnout. We need volunteers to set up, clean up, stuff eggs, hide eggs, and a bunch of other areas. If you're interested in volunteering, or you want to sign your child up for the Easter egg hunt, go to the Church Center app. Rain, snow, or shine, we'll see you at the Easter egg hunt on March 30th. There are four ways to give here at Bethel Full Gospel. Number one, you can go to our church website. Number two, you can go to the Church Center app. Number three, you can write a check and mail it to 3669 Gilderland Ave here in Schenectady. And number four, you can give in person by giving in our baskets in the rear. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Pastor Jose Renteria, and we're here at the border, the hill you see behind me, that's Mexico. This is the river uh, Rio Grande, the Mexican side, they call it Rio Bravo. And we're in a small town called Rio Bravo in the Texas side. So we're just looking around and seeing how things look. But that's the river that divides Mexico and the U.S. Hey Bethel, Pastor Steve here, and I am with Jose Renteria. Jose is one of our missionaries that we support, and he is down in Laredo, Texas, very close to the border. We are super excited because we get to come down here and work with him this fall on the first missions trip that we've taken in a couple of years. So Pastor Jose, why don't you share a little bit about what we have going on down here in Laredo and uh, the ministry. Uh, first, I want to say thank you, Pastor Steve, for giving me the opportunity to talk to Bethel. And it's so exciting. We have friends there. You know, we know you, some of you. Some of you do not know my wife and I, but I just want to tell you, we love you guys very much. We're here right at the border where everything begins, you know, and kind of ends over there in your area. So we would like to invite you and come and do some ministry with us. We, will, we are going to be doing ministry right by the river, close to the river. We have a church only a couple of blocks from that area. 
there's a lot of needs. You will feel like you're in Mexico. You will feel like you're in another country and you will be building God's kingdom. So I want you to pray. I want you to ask God to give you direction and we cannot wait to see you guys as soon as possible. We are excited to, to be doing the work of God and partnering with this brother. So stay tuned, Bethel, more information to come. Good morning, church. Third Sunday of the month, Mission Sunday. We usually highlight what we're doing with missions and some opportunities. So we have a trip coming to the border uh, later this fall because I don't want to go to Texas in 110 degrees. So we're waiting till the fall, and it is a construction trip and a ministry trip. So if you have skills in construction or you don't have skills in construction, this trip is for you, all right? E either side, there's work to be done. So if you are interested, see Pastor Eric. You'll be hearing more details on that as the time approaches. So we are here in this beautiful pre-Easter March and on the back table, we have these invite cards for Easter Sunday. It's going to be full. That's all right. We're ready for that. But do me a favor. If you have a friend, a family member, a loved one, a coworker, so your waitress, not in place of a tip, uh, somebody in your life that you know well who doesn't have a church, invite them to come and join us. Invite them to come on out. Uh, we're believing for big things. We're believing, of course, it's, it's always full on Easter, but more than full, we're believing in souls to be added to the kingdom. So if that is your heart as it is ours, invite someone. Don't show up alone. We have the invites in back. On the front is our Easter services. On the back, uh, the Easter egg hunt. That Saturday, of course, we got two baskets out there for the Easter egg hunt. We need you candy. So come, bring your candy. Don't put your children in the baskets. We don't want your children. We do want, again, Pastor Eric's son was in the basket. We don't want your kids. We do want your candy. I don't know how that translates into Spanish. So I think I said it right, but I'm not sure. So in any case, candy, candy. Yes, we need your candy for Easter. And we're going to be stuffing eggs uh, for the two weeks preceding. If you're interested in helping out with that, go ahead and see Pastor Naylene, how are my second service friends doing today? You good? So it's St. Patrick's Day. We don't really care about that because we're Italian. So, no, no, I'm kidding. I'm it was a joke. It was a joke. This is Chad McFarland's day. This is his moment. God bless you, brother. Um, we had about 15 families or so from second service go to first service today. So if you were able to park and if you were able to sit with your family this morning, I got the names of some families you can thank. <laughs> we are still looking for some people. Help us out. There's a lot of room still in first service. So we are kindly asking our second service friends, if you are able and willing to join us for first service, we would love to have you at first service. Uh, it gives us some more space here. It helps fill that service in, which is nice. So if you're able to do that, we greatly appreciate it. If that is too much of a big step in your faith, <sighs> second thing you can do to help me out, move up. Move up. Let's, let's, some of you moved up today, and I thank you, I noticed that. Moving up is good because it creates some space because the last place people want to sit, I don't know why, is the front row right in front of me. I think I'm friendly. I think this is a great seat. But in any case, uh, if you would slide up, that would help us a lot. And I see some of you still rolling your eyes. So if switching services is beyond the limits of your faith, if moving up a couple rows, really, is beyond the limits of your faith, there's something else you can do to help me. The last option, really. Just move in. Just move in, leave the outside. Just move in. Because this is the last place to fill up. The second last place, the middles. The, so if your faith isn't big enough to come to 830, and if it's way too much for you to actually move up a couple of rows, just slide to the middle a little. I know the end seats are great. I know. But just slide in. 
to slide it a little bit uh, or get here early enough to get an outside end seat. Those work. Um, but all little things you can do to help your church, especially Easter coming, Easter Sunday. Uh, mom, dad, kids, if you can come in, I don't know, one vehicle that Sunday, that'd be super. I know we took three today. Uh, sometimes we take four. We're going to streamline for Easter. So if you can do that, there's lots of little things that you can do in preparation for Easter Sunday and also even not Easter Sunday, man. God's growing his church, amen? I am not complaining about God growing his church. If it sounds like I'm complaining, maybe I'm complaining a little, but I'm not complaining about the spiritual part of it. That's great. I'm just complaining about some physical parts of it. So we're excited. We're excited to see some new faces, see some new faces here this morning. Uh, good to see some returning faces that are newer as well. So thank you for joining us. We're, we're excited to have you. We're excited at what God's doing here. And uh, we're definitely looking forward to Easter. We've been talking for the last month, uh, two weeks, today will be three, uh, about the most important event in human history, the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, good Good Friday, we celebrate the cross. That is the, the lead-in to Easter. And looking at the cross and, and what it is and what it means, historically, the cross was a, a form of capital punishment, the maximum penalty that you can pay for your, for your transgressions in the Roman Empire was the cross. Uh, it was invented by other civilizations, but the Romans, I don't know if you say perfected it, but they really got good at it. Uh, some historians estimate between 100 and 150,000 people the Romans crucified. Murderers, mostly insurrectionists, those who would rise up against Rome. Uh, pictures in, in history books of, of different roads lined with crucified criminals. This was a brutal, brutal form of death. We know it was agonizingly painful. Some people who were crucified remained there for as long as four days before they finally expired. Did you know the cause of death with crucifixion? I don't know if you knew this or not. It's slow asphyxiation. Uh, if the loss of blood and all of the other trauma or shock didn't take you, it was slowly losing your ability to breathe. And this was just absolutely horrific. The events of Good Friday recall for us that the Son of God didn't just give his life. He, he went to the cross for our sins. If there was any other way, Jesus would have preferred it. That was his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, if there's any way this cup can pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I want, but what you want. Not my will, but your will be done. The Son of God, Jesus, willingly went to the cross to pay the price for my sins and yours, to gain us access into heaven, to restore our relationship with God. And these are the things that we've been talking about for the last couple weeks. Everything that Jesus accomplished for us at the cross. We, we use some big words. There will be a, a quiz at the end of the, the message series. I'll be handing out a brief scantron. You'll have to fill in the appropriate definitions. If you're not sure, guess C. That's a little pro tip. <laughs> First week, we talked about Reconciliation. We went on and we talked about substitution, propitiation, whew, atonement. Last week, we dug into the idea of justification, sanctification, redemption, and regeneration. If you didn't take notes, you forgot literally what all of those meant other than I'm pretty sure Jesus died for our sins. Like you grab that and that's the important part. But all these other things that Jesus accomplished for us at the cross. This morning, I want to look at just two more things. And only one is a tricky word. The other one's really easy. <laughs> all right? Two more things that Jesus accomplished for us at the cross. And we'll wrap up the series with that. Next week, we'll, Pastor Eric's going to share in a little, little different direction before we get into uh, Easter Sunday and the events of that weekend. Two things I want to talk to you about today. First one, 
Number one, I want to speak to you about healing. Healing. This series is what Jesus accomplished for us at the cross. At the cross, Jesus Christ provided for your healing this morning. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Would you say amen to anything I said, though? <laughs> Maybe. At the cross, we know from the scripture itself that Jesus and his sacrifice provides not only for our spiritual healing, but also for our physical healing. And we're going to look at that this morning. Now, there are those who believe, maybe some of you here today, that don't believe that healing is for today. Like maybe in the, maybe in the Bible it talks about healing, but that's not something that's happening this morning. Well, to subscribe to that idea, you have to do a couple things. First, you have to ignore the experiences of literally millions of people who God has supernaturally touched through the ages. You just have to assume all of them are crazy. Are some of them? Probably. Does that have anything to do with their healing? Probably, maybe not. I don't know. There's crazy people everywhere. That's not like a disclaimer. Are, are some of those people weird? Yes. Are all tens of hundreds of millions of, no. No, God has supernaturally moved. There are people in this room this morning that can share with you supernatural things that God has done in their body. So, okay, you have to ignore all of that. Secondly, you have to ignore a very clear teaching of Scripture. I'm going to show that to you this morning. The, the, this is not a gray area in Scripture. This is abundantly clear that Jesus provided for our healing at the cross. You have to ignore a lot of Scripture to come to that conclusion. And lastly, by doing so, you're discounting what Jesus did for us. First verse I want to share with you today. This might be the first time you've heard it in this kind of pre-Easter season. Likely won't be the last time. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. Written hundreds of years before Jesus is on the scene, Isaiah prophesies about the coming Messiah and says this, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. The literal definition of wounded here in the Hebrew means pierced through. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement or the punishment for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Now, there's been some debate about if this healing mentioned in Isaiah is specifically spiritual healing. First and foremost, Jesus came for our spiritual healing. Everything we've discussed for the last several weeks highlight the fact that Jesus came for our spiritual healing. But this passage and others also talk about the physical healing. So what is this passage talking about? The best way to interpret this passage is to look at the scripture. One of the best tools to interpreting scripture is using scripture. Not somebody's sermon, not a different book that you picked up, or even a commentary. The best way to understand some confusing text is to look within the rest of the text of the word of God itself and see if it provides some answers. Well, we have some answers here when it comes to spiritual healing or physical healing? I'll give you the answer up front. Both. Both. And here's what the scripture tells us. In the gospel of Matthew, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the first gospel, Matthew, the tax collector, he uses this scripture from Isaiah in reference to Jesus healing people who were sick. 
Matthew connects Isaiah with this idea of physical healing. That's pretty good. Later, in one of Peter's epistles, Peter uses the exact same verse out of Isaiah to highlight for us spiritual healing. So the answer to this isn't it's one or the other. The answer from Scripture, they're not arguing with each other. They're saying it applies to both. Jesus died on the cross for your spiritual healing, first and foremost, to take your broken down, marred by sin, decrepit soul, and to bring peace between you and God. That's why he went to the cross, spiritual healing. But Jesus also provided at the cross for your weak, powerless, decrepit body <laughs> to also be healed. Both of these at the cross. Spiritual healing provided for. Physical healing provided for. In James 5.14, the half-brother of Jesus instructs us, if any of you is sick, call for the elders of the church, anoint them with oil, and pray in faith. The, the Bible tells us to pray for healing. Seems ironic to tell us to do that if God doesn't do it. Like, that'd be kind of silly, right? You there? James and, and many verses in the New Testament instruct us to pray. But it's not even just spiritual and physical healing. Let me throw this on. Emotional healing is provided for. I think somebody give me an amen on that. <laughs> Psalms 147.3 tells us that he heals the brokenhearted. I won't ask you to raise your hand to self-identify as brokenhearted this morning. I want you to know Jesus knows that and he sees you and he loves you and he cares. Physical healing, yes. Emotional healing, yes. Spiritual healing, first and foremost. All of this provided for at the cross. And healing is still for today. Mark 16, verse 17, Jesus said this. And these signs will follow who? Okay, like it's on the screen. I'm not asking you a <laughs> pop question here. Remember from my teaching last week. No, it's literally like you can read it. These signs will follow. Not pastors, not only the disciples, not only the early church fathers for a period of 70 years. That, like there's some weird theories out there. These signs will follow those who believe. Hmm, okay. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up servants, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. Doesn't mean you need to play with snakes. Relax, Kentucky. <laughs> Divine protection. Great. Last part. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. We have this theological fact that God, through his son Jesus, provided for physical healing, then we have multiple commands of scripture telling us not only Jesus heals, but we're to pray for it. We're, we're to ask for it. We're to have other people pray for it. We're to expect it. We're to pray for others to receive it. Physical healing and spiritual healing together. And here is the thing about Physical hearing, healing. It's not if God will heal you. Scripture makes it abundantly clear. He will 100% of the time heal your body. Yeah. Not, not maybe, not, you know, if you pray the right way. Guaranteed you are healed 100% of the time. The part that gets us is the when. When will we be healed? 
You have loved ones, you have friends, you have people that you know who passed away from sickness. I want you to know if they passed away in Christ this morning because of what Jesus did on the cross for them, they are 100% fully and completely healed in the presence of God. 100% guaranteed. Combine that with the millions of people who have experienced healing on this earth. It's not a question of if God will heal. God will heal. He promises that. The only question is when. Will it be in this life or will it be in the next? Will it be on, on this side of heaven or will it be in heaven? Either way, we are guaranteed that God is a healer. He always heals us because 2,000 years ago on an old rugged cross, Jesus paid the price and it, it accounted, it provided for us healing in his name. Spiritual healing, most important, but also physical, also emotional, paid for in full at the cross. Now let me give you a side note, not a disclaimer. Jesus always heals no doubt about it, but a side note, because I know the question. I know the question that goes on in our minds and the different things that we think of when it comes to healing. Why not now? Like, I know Jesus will, will heal me in heaven someday. Why not? Like, I wasn't thinking in heaven someday. I was thinking like Monday, <laughs> early Monday if we could, right? Right? And we ask the question, why doesn't God heal us all the time like right now in this life, not waiting to heaven? There's an answer for that. You may not like the answer, but there's an answer to that. And this answer kind of goes back and it hinges on our verse for the series that the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are saved, it's the power of God unto salvation. The problem is this. If our physical lives, if this flesh and blood was the most important thing, if the most valuable thing about us was our health and our numbers and our our beats per minute and our cell count and all of these other things, if that was the most important thing, this physical life, God would absolutely heal it 100% of the time. But if the most important thing was our spiritual life, if the most important thing was our commitment to God and receiving what he did for us on the cross, if that was the most important thing, God would most certainly put the emphasis there. See, for those who have put their faith in Christ, you have 100% received spiritual healing. The physical healing will come sooner or later. But the most important thing is that your eternity has been secured, that you are with Jesus, you're on his team forever. And even though we don't like to think about it this way, that's the most important thing. This becomes for us uh, a mindset problem. We begin to think that this life is the most important thing. And listen, I, I get it. I, I'm not one of those people. You ever meet someone like who's just so super like spiritual, you wonder if they float? Like, I can't even talk to you right now. It's like, you, you are on another plane, all right? I'm not that guy. I understand that we have things in this physical world that impact us, all right? I mean, when, when your taxes come and you got a bill to pay, are you like... I am a citizen of another kingdom. <laughs> so I reject that in Jesus' name. Like, like, amen, I get it, but you probably should pay that. We have bills to pay, I get it. We have problems on this earth, I absolutely get it. There's people problems, get it. We have physical problems. We have physical problems with loved ones or family members. Like, 
all of those things absolutely 100% happen. But here's the thing. Heaven and our eternal soul has been taken care of by God Almighty. And if all we ever think about is the temporary and we forget the eternal, we're missing the point. We're, we're missing out. We're, we're not truly getting or understanding just how much Jesus accomplished for us at the cross. We have this idea of, well, that's later. That, that's then. This is now. Now I want this, 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 and this, God. And you haven't been doing any of those things, so I don't even know if you're real. And that's how we feel sometimes. But God has provided for our eternity. And if you're here today and you've placed your faith in Jesus for your salvation, eternity is not later. It's begun now. You're never gone. You're, you're with Jesus forever. You're starting here. It gets better there, but we're eternal. God's created us to be eternal. Heaven is in our hearts, is in our life right now, as well as what God has promised for us. What he's promised is so much greater than what we're going through in the here and now. We have to fix a mindset and we have to start thinking about things how God thinks about them. After this life, there's eternity, and that is God's top priority. Now, that ties into the second thing I want to talk about. So the first one is healing. Physical healing, more importantly, spiritual healing provided for at the cross. The second one I want to talk about is a big word. Glorification. I introed this last week. We talked about sanctification, quick review, process of being set apart. That's what it means. When Jesus died at the cross and you placed your faith in him, he set you apart. You went from sinner to saint immediately. St. Patrick's got nothing on you. <laughs> at the cross, you went from sinner to saint. Instantaneous sanctification done. Then we talked about the progressive, the process of sanctification. Every day, you and I, as followers of Jesus, trying to be more like Christ. We are not who we were on day one. God is changing us. We're growing. We're getting stronger in our faith. Does it happen immediately? No. No. Is there a shortcut? No. You work and you train and you see the gains over time. That's not just diet and exercise. That's in your faith. You're immediately a saint. When you want to see it start showing up in different areas in your life, you start putting in the work. You get in your word. You get in a church. You start sharing your faith. You worship God. You discipline yourself. You say no to the old life. All that last week, that progressive sanctification. The third phase of sanctification is glorification or the final sanctification or the final product or as I like to call it, we win. Like the best part of the story, we win. Final glorification is when this weak, broken down body gets the new one. The new one's perfect. You don't sleep wrong in heaven. You may have slept wrong last night and you feel it. You don't sleep wrong in heaven. Hallelujah. The Bible says there's no more sickness there. There's no more death. No more pain. Jesus will wipe away every tear from your eye. Glorification comes from the word glory. Definition for glory is high renown or honor by notable achievements. Usually we talk about glory. We talk about like sports teams. That's so insignificant next to heaven. But glory, you, you've achieved the pinnacle. You've done the most you can do. The final step of our process with Jesus that he provided for us at the cross, this glorification that all things become new and we're with Jesus forever and we win and sin and death and the grave 
lose and we win and we're with Jesus forever and we win. We win. This is important. In 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, Paul pens three verses that highlight for us the depth of glorification and the mindset that we need to have as believers. Here we go. Verse 16. Because in the end we win, therefore we do not lose heart. Come on. Some of you are walking around like losers. And you forgot that we win. Therefore, we don't lose heart. We're not dragging her oh, till Jesus comes. I just want to be with him. Oh, woe is me. Stop it. You're a winner. You're a victor in Christ. We've already won. Therefore, not because you feel good, because you might not. Not because everything's going perfect, because it might not be. Not because you don't have a care in the world, you probably do. We don't lose heart because Jesus won for us on the cross. We have victory because of him. Therefore, we do not lose heart even though our outward man is perishing. Oh, I feel that in my soul. <laughs> the outward man is perishing, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. Amen. Get the mindset here. Verse 17, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, the NIV says our light and temporary affliction. The Apostle Paul said, all your whining, not me, I didn't say it, Paul said it. <laughs> all of our complaining, all of our sadness, and we get discouraged. Paul calls it light and temporary. How can he call such terrible things that we, we've endured in life light and temporary? This is how. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. In other words, what God has for you is so much exceedingly, eternally better. Whatever's got you down is light, and it's temporary. We win. The mindset needs to change. At the cross of Christ where Jesus died, he didn't promise us a future victory. He won the victory right there. Later in Corinthians, Paul says that he disarmed the powers and authorities and put them to a public shame, triumphing over them at the cross. He didn't just beat the enemy, he whooped him. He beat him silly and we have the victory because of him. Paul's not done. Verse 18 gives us the mindset again. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. This changes how we think. This changes our mindset completely. We think about glory and we think about sports. There's no comparison, but I'll give you a sports analogy. Giants fans, you can relate to this. Imagine your team is down by 30. <laughs> you, you all get it. <laughs> but you know you're guaranteed that they win in the end. Down 30, but you know that they win. The first quarter, you fumble the opening, opening kickoff, and you're like, here we go. Oh, my goodness. But you know we're going to win. Yeah, this will be cool. And then you're down another score, and you're like, wow, that's rough. But no, we're good. We're going to win this one. And then they just keep piling it on, as Giants fans have grown accustomed. 
But with this difference today, you're guaranteed to win. At some point when you're down 30 in the fourth, but you know you're going to win, and the team sacks you for a safety. Now it's 32. You just laugh because you're like, boy, this is ridiculous. Thank goodness we're going to win. Now here's the thing. Giants never win. (laughs) (laughs) But believer, that's our story. That's our guarantee at the cross. You might feel like you're down 30 late in the third, but you're guaranteed to win. And there's no chance of you losing. There's no point spread to cover, okay? You win. Oh, man, this first quarter went rough, or the second quarter, the third, we're really struggling. But you win. And it's not maybe, and it's not if you do all the things right. No, no, keep your faith in Jesus. He already won for you. That's, that's the beauty of glorification. When it's all done, we win. We win. And you have friends and you have loved ones and you have family members. You have people in your life who have gone on to be with Jesus. You have friends from this church who have gone on to be with Jesus. And you know what every single one of them would say if they could talk to you right now as they are experiencing the far exceeding and eternal weight of glory. They would tell you this, it's worth it. Listen, suck it up. Hang in there for a little while. It is so worth it because we win. They know, they get it. Hebrews 11 and 12 talks about that that great cloud of witnesses that has gone before us. They're in heaven cheering for you. They're like, hang in there, bro. We win this thing. Man, some of you need to just like remember that and just say it to yourself all week because you don't feel like you're winning. And this world has got your head twisted and it's got your soul dejected. And at the cross of Jesus Christ, Jesus didn't guarantee future victory. He won it then and there, and we walk in the victory that Jesus gave us. Glorification, final victory. And to that I say, it's about time. Let's go, right? No more of this. Give me more of that. That is the mindset for the follower of Jesus foolishness to those who are perishing but to those who are being saved the gospel is the power of god unto salvation glorification god's final removal of sin from the life of the believer the final victory completely accomplished at the cross so as we wrap up this series and i'll ask the worship team to come how do, we, how do we respond to these things? Everything Jesus did for us at the cross, we talked about healing and victory today, but we've talked about forgiveness. We've talked about access to God. We've talked about having our price paid in full. Just a whole laundry list of things that Jesus accomplished for us. What's our response to him? Our response is how we live. Our response to Jesus is, because you've accomplished all these things for me, I'm going to give my life to you. Because you've done all these things for me, God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to praise your name. I'm going to give to the poor, and I'm going to help those who are down, and I'm going to have faith even when others don't, and I'm going to kind of discard those, those old ways before I knew you and walk in what you call me to walk in. This is our reasonable response, Paul calls it in Romans 12. This is our reasonable response in light of everything that God has done for us. We're going to live for you. It is not, I'm going to be good so I can earn my salvation. It is not, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give so that I can earn some credit with God. Nope. It's not, I'm going to join this church or this religion. I'm going to be a Catholic or a Baptist or a Methodist or a Pentecostal. I'm not going to like sign some paper because then it'll get me into heaven. No, heaven was won for us on the cross. Our lives here are worship to God, obedience, how we respond to him. It's just worship. You're not earning your salvation. 
You're not earning yourself a better seat at the table. You have access to that table only because of what Jesus did. Our response is how we live for it. Your response to all this, it's not verbal. It's not amen. It's not, I concur, pastor. It's how you live. And Jesus sees your response to all this. He sees it every single day. He sees it in the choices we make. He sees it in the words that we speak. He sees it in our priorities of life. That's our response to God. I'll share one more verse with you as we close this morning. Scary verse, scary, scary verse in Hebrews 10, 26. And this is what it says. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Just a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries, another translation says, the enemies of God. If we sin willfully after we've received knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Let me tell you what that doesn't mean. If you're here and at some point in the past, you've put your faith in Jesus, and since that point, you done messed up, you're going to hell, you're out of luck. <laughs> that's not what the verse means. Thank God that's not what the verse means. <laughs> what the verse does mean is there's only one sacrifice for your sins. And it was accomplished on the cross. And there is no other sacrifice for sins. And Jesus isn't gonna go and do it again for you. There was one sacrifice. The Bible says Jesus died one time for all time. There's one sacrifice for sin. There's no other way. This is important for us because as we've talked about the cross of Jesus, I've repeatedly said, it's the only way. Well, pastor, that's really narrow-minded. I know that's what the Bible says. But pastor, what about other religions? They have good people. I know it's tragic if they don't know Jesus and if they have not embraced the cross, they, good people will spend eternity separated from God. That's what the Bible teaches. There's no other way. There's no other sacrifice. You can't be good enough. You can't look good enough. You can't dress good enough. You can't even act good enough. It's not enough. The only sacrifice, the only way in is what Jesus did for you on that cross. There's no other sacrifice for our sins. Only Jesus. So how do we respond to this? I have the answer. It's a good response. Embrace the cross. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, my friend, I implore you, embrace the cross. Receive what he did for you there. If you're here today and your body is broken, and you need healing, I got something for you too. Embrace the cross. If you're here and you're having a hard time because the things of this world just have your mind racing, I've got some advice for you as well. You wanna guess it? Embrace the cross. Because no matter what we're facing or what we're dealing with or what we're going through, things in this world, things in the world to come, matters of our faith, matters of our family, physical needs, spiritual needs, whatever, embrace the cross. At the cross of Jesus, God did everything that we needed him to do. God gave us access. God tells us to go boldly to the throne of grace. God opened up the door so that we can be with him for eternity. He took care of all of it. Your job, my job, embrace the cross. Jesus said, pick that cross up daily and follow me. And that's our job. 
embrace the cross. Embrace what Jesus did for us there. Embrace all that this means and let him change not just your life here and now, let him change your eternity. Let him change your forever. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I'll ask our altar team if they would come up and we close as we usually do with a song and a time for some prayer. And I don't know who you are this morning and I don't know what your, your background is. I don't know what your, your spiritual position might be. There, there's a lot of new faces and those I don't know well. I don't know if you're coming out of another church history or faith tradition, but the only thing you need to know is what God's word, not what I said, what God's word said. At the cross of Jesus is everything that we need. Friend, if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you don't even know what that means, you need that today. You, you need, that's what embracing the cross means for you, that you need to begin your relationship with Jesus. There's no other way, there's no other sacrifice for all of the sins that we commit, only what Jesus did for us at the cross. If that's you, you need to respond to him today. If you find that, that your mindset is so far from where it needs to be, that you've put so much weight on the temporary and you've been forgetting the eternal, friend, Jesus loves you. Embrace that cross. That's what it means for you. If you're here today and, and you're, you're hurting, you have physical needs, you have emotional pain. Jesus took care of that too. May he, every stone got turned over. He just took care of all of it at the cross. If you're here this morning and you need prayer, don't wait. Come, come to this altar. Just take a spot and just cry out to God. He'll meet you here. You, you want someone to pray for you. There's people here who will pray for you. It's time for you to embrace your cross. This is personal. This isn't corporate, this isn't institutional. Your family can't grandfather you in. This is you, this is your choice. Young person, I'm talking to you this morning. This is you. Embrace the cross of Jesus, because at that cross, we find all the answers. We find everything that God has for us. Would you stand together with me? and bow your heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you that you are drawing people, not to a church, draw us to the cross. Draw us to what you did for us on that cross, on the price that you paid, the access you provided, how you took care of everything. Lord, as we look at that cross this morning and for the rest of this resurrection season, and Lord, all year long. It reminds us how much you love us. That you loved us so much. You went through all of this for us. Lord, for that one who's feeling unloved this morning, may they find the love of Jesus at the cross. For that one who's feeling very far from God, would they find the love of Jesus at the cross. Lord, for everything that you provided for us, let us take hold of it. Let us live lives worthy of the calling that we have received. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. Speak to hearts, I pray, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. As we sing this morning, if that's you, I encourage you, let's come, let's pray, let's spend these next few moments together. And so I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross for a crown on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross the emblem of suffering and shame and I love Oh, the old rugged cross.
cross so despised by the world has a wondrous attraction for me for the dear lamb of god left his glory
Father, as we look to the cross, we see the sacrifice, we see the blood, we see the pierced hands, all to transform us. Father, remind us that this is just temporary. We're living for, for some place that right now we can't see. By faith, we trust and believe. This world is not our home. Thank you. Thank you that this world is not our home. We love you and we worship you in your name. Amen. Have a blessed week, church.